All right, so uh, we are in chapter 11. This is the last uh, chapter uh, we're going to have before the uh, fourth exam, I guess. And um, uh, this we're covering in this chapter is the concepts of uh, static equilibrium. There's some other concepts near the end on elasticity, and, and, and that's not something we're going to be covering. Uh, so you only need to concern with static equilibrium problems. All right, so what is static equilibrium? Well, static equilibrium is, well, you know static equilibrium, actually. We've, we talked about that before. That's when you have uh, your F net being zero, and you don't have any motion, right? A, a dynamic equilibrium is one where you have F net, and you do have constant motion. So um, <clears throat> now that we're in the chapters that are dealing with rotations and things like that, we have an additional condition that we are going to put on our static equilibrium. And that is, in addition to having no net forces, we're going to have no net torques. Okay, so if F net is zero and uh, tau net torque is zero, then the object will not have any translational or rotational motion to it. And uh, this is a very important part of a uh, field known as statics, which is one of the maybe the first classes you'll take as an engineering student, uh, understanding the structural stability of things is a pretty important thing uh, when it comes to building stuff. So um, this is going to be, this is going to act as basically an introduction to that topic because of course if you're an engineering student you're going to be taking an entire class on this. Alright, <clears throat> so the way we go about solving these problems is we have an object, right? And um, we'll have several forces that act on the object. One of the things you'll need to do is you'll need to select a pivot point. Uh, and this is, this is a point by which you're going to analyze um, all the different torques that are being exerted on the object. Uh, there's a lot of freedom with how you choose that pivot point. And I'll talk more about that when we get into um, some examples of that. Um, you want to determine all the forces, x direction, y direction. If there's a z direction, we don't do z directions in 110, but you can certainly handle that. And then you consider all the torques, keeping in mind all of the, uh, the correct signs for things, right? If you have a counterclockwise torque, that's positive. And if you have a negative uh, torque, that's clockwise. Of course, part of Determining torque is understanding the radial line, right? Or you, if you want to consider moment arms, uh, but you do need to consider how that force is being applied relative to that pivot point, right? What you will end up with if you do everything correctly is you'll have a system of equations, three. Um, you won't generally have three variables. Uh, you may have just one or two, and you may not need all of the equations. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for, but. Um, as a general practice, though, you have to write out all three of the equations until you get to a point where you're sort of comfortable, you know, seeing exactly what's being solved for. Clearly, if the problem is one variable, there's only one thing you don't know, um, you can obviously opt for just one equation. All right. So here's a example right off the bat here. So you have various forces applied at various locations, and you want to determine which object is in static equilibrium. So think about this for a minute, you may want to pause the video, but the answer here is D. Okay, why? Well, it's because uh, you first, well, now we only have two things to consider here, X direction forces and their respective torques. Okay. So if you look at A, for example, okay, you'll see that A has two forces that go to the right and one force that goes to the left, and all forces uh, have an equal magnitude. So A will move to the right. I don't even need to consider what kind of torque it's going to experience because it's clearly not in static equilibrium, although you can see that the forces that are in the middle here, um, they're not going to uh, contribute to any rotation, but the one at the top is going to do that. B, we have a similar situation with B. Um, it looks just like A, except one of our forces is pushed down on the right-hand side, 
And so you still have the problem with you don't have a balance of forces in the x direction. Uh, B all happens to um, have uh, no torque because, uh, of course, the one in the middle on the left doesn't do anything for rotation, but the, the ones on the top and the bottom, um, they're, they're going to attempt to rotate the object in opposite directions, so they're going to cancel out. C looks better. Um, we have uh, a larger vector to the left that looks like it's going to balance the ones on the right in terms of x direction motion, so it's not going to rotate in x direction. But uh, this thing's definitely going to rotate. Um, the upper right uh, vector is going to make things go clockwise, whereas the other two is going to make things go counterclockwise. And the object will spin counterclockwise. D, however, is great. D is very close to B. Remember, B had no torque, no net torque. D also has no net torque, but it has a longer vector going to the left, which means it also balances the x direction stuff. Okay. So the, the pivot, we just chose the pivot to be the center of mass here, which is a fine choice. Um, you know, your pivot can be the literal pivot, or it can be, honestly, it can be um, in a location that makes it mathematically or conceptually easier for you to solve. Um, it, it, of course, if we do determine that the object turns, um, you know, then you would have to consider the actual pivot point um, to, uh, to work out things like, you know, the kinematics and things like that. Right? Okay, so let's just get into an example right away. Um, but basically, uh, I've explained all the concept. <laughs> that's, that's the entire concept that you need to be concerned about for this chapter. And it's, this is just an exercise in looking at lots and lots of examples. Uh, we don't really see necessarily anything new. Um, there's a little bit of strategy in solving these problems, which I'm obviously going to go over. But uh, in terms of concept, that's you, you already have the concept. All right, so what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at a uh, massless rod, okay? Now, why is it massless? Well, I mean, normally if something has mass, you'll consider gravitational torque, um, but we just want to worry about forces and things. So imagine that, you know, this object is, you know, maybe it's uh, it's an overhead view and it's resting on a table, or, or maybe we can just think of hypotheticals and it's just massless, okay? So, um, I mean, you can see right off the bat here, right? Uh, 100 newtons going down, 100 newtons going up. Uh, the forces in the y direction add up to zero. So clearly it does not move up or down. It clearly doesn't move left or right. There is simply no forces in the x direction. The question becomes, um, are, is there going to be a torque here? All right. So that's what we need to figure out. So let's go look at that example. All right, so um, as I mentioned here, we do not need to be concerned about the forces in the y direction. They add up to zero. For our torque, um, we are free to choose the pivot anywhere we like. Uh, for the purposes of solving static equilibrium problems, for the meaning, for the purposes of determining if objects rotate or not, we have freedom to choose our pivot. It does not necessarily have to be at the center of mass. It doesn't necessarily be at the, you know, if there's actual, like, axle and there's a pivot somewhere. As I mentioned, if the object actually starts to move, you would need to consider that. But for the purposes of the static check, you don't need to do that. And there's a mathematical reason why. Um, it's sort of a translation across the rod here. Uh, the, the sum of all of the torques here, the R times Fs, will be the same regardless of the pivot point. That's just mathematically why it works out that way. All right, so the left end is our pivot. So if the left end is our pivot, then what we need to consider here is the values for R that will appear in the torques. <clears throat> now, the 40 Newton force occurs at the pivot. So the value of R is zero, okay? Any force applied to a pivot cannot rotate an object. So then we need to only consider the other two. We have 100 newtons pointing down. That is exactly two meters away from the pivot. Now, <clears throat> the value of R is clearly two. The magnitude of the force is 100. It is a negative torque. It's a negative torque because if this force were to act by itself, it would cause a clockwise rotation. So that means it's a negative torque. Okay. Now, one thing that a lot of students make the mistake of is they see this and they say, oh, 
the torque is negative because the force points downward. Um, the negative 100 would appear in the Fy equation, but to determine signs in torque equations, you need to consider how an object might rotate, not whether a force is up or down or left or right. Okay? The fact that it's down and the pivot is to the left means counter Sorry, it means clockwise rotation. All right, so for the 60 newtons, same deal. It's three meters away from the pivot, and the force is 60, and this would result in a counterclockwise rotation. So we add up the two torques, as you can see down here. We end up with a negative 20 newton meters, and so that means because the sum of torques is not zero, that means the object will rotate, and uh, because the net torque is negative, the object will um, be rotating in a clockwise manner. All right, so that's just the check. So we can. So the problem was, is this thing moving or not, and in what way? It is moving. It has no translational motion. It will be rotating though, and that's where the problem stops. Again, there's additional things you could solve about this, but that's beyond the scope of what this problem is intended to show you. All right, let's get back to it. Okay, we immediately have another problem here. Ugh, cats. Ugh. Okay, let's do a cat problem. All right, so we have a more complicated problem here. Uh, we're trying to balance a seesaw. We have two different cats here and a bowl of tuna that is sitting on a seesaw. And we have to figure out where one of our cats is going to be located to make sure things remain balanced. So um, our five kilogram cat is on the right. I'm calling that cat number two. Uh, we have cat number one, who is a four kilogram cat. And it's going to be to the left of the pivot there. So we need to consider all the masses here because the forces that are being exerted for the most part are a bunch of gravities. There is a normal force that's exerted by the pivot that supports the weight of everything. And um, so um, <clears throat> I've drawn here you know, vectors uh, pointing down for those things. We don't know exactly how far to the left um, that four kilogram cat is. Um, and so we want to write out equations here. Now there's only one variable in this, so that means we only really need one equation to solve this. Clearly there's nothing you'll need to be concerned about in the x-direction, as there's no forces in the x-direction. You could create a y-direction um, equation, and that would allow you to solve for the normal force, if you care about that, which we don't, but you could certainly do that. So I'm going to use just the torque equation, and I'm going to choose a pivot point that is at the actual pivot. The reason why I'm doing that is because I can ignore the effects of the normal force in my equation, because all the all our value, our value would be zero. And so I can just completely ignore the normal force, but I don't have to ignore the normal force. I could put it anywhere else I'd like to, put the pivot anywhere else I'd like to, but then I'd have to invoke a second equation because there would then be a second variable. Uh, by cleverly choosing the pivot at the actual pivot, not too clever, I suppose, you can uh, avoid an equation. All right. So uh, for each one of these forces, we're trying to consider uh, what the torque is. So the cat that's on the right is, if it acted alone, it would cause a clockwise rotation. So that's a negative torque. The other two would cause a counterclockwise rotation, so those are positive torques. I'm going to start with the tuna. The tuna is two meters to the left, and Fg is simply the weight of that tuna, so that'll be its mass times 9.8. For the cat number one, which is on the left here, we have some unknown distance d from the pivot. Mass is four, 9.8 is gravity. Uh, we have a negative because of the counter, sorry, the clockwise torque. Um, the other cat is also two meters to the right, and uh, with a mass of five. And yeah, 9.8s drop out of the equation. We have a very simple 4 plus 4d minus 10 equals 0. We solve for d and we get 1.5 meters. So the, what's being shown, the d being shown is much, much longer than, in, than, than being displayed here. So the cats would be somewhere farther over here. But, um, but uh, in this case, this was a little more complicated because we didn't know 
where a third force would be to keep things balanced, but um, as long as you know how to evaluate the torques and realize what the forces are, um, then, uh, then it's not too bad to solve. There is one thing kind of missing here. Kind of missing. In fact, it looks like... Hmm, anyway, um, we're not told if the seesaw itself is, is massless or not. Uh, we're not given a mass. So there would be a, a, an additional force here that would be the weight of the seesaw, but it would also be applied at the center of mass, which is the location of the pivot, which is another reason why we'd really want to choose the pivot to be the actual pivot, because then we'd have to invoke this uh, weight of the seesaw, which, um, I mean, we, we wouldn't really be able to do that um, because we're missing information. But again, choosing the right pivot allows you to avoid a lot. Oh, we got another problem. All right, we're just getting down to it here, aren't we? Okay. So we got Adrian and Bo. They're playing on a 100 kilogram rig rigid plank, rested on two supports. Uh, Adrian's going to stay stationary. She's going to be on the left. Bo's going to walk to the right. And we want to know how far Bo can go before things flip, even if that occurs. Maybe it doesn't, by the way. But we will certainly find out. Okay, so let's assume that it does, though. And I can explain how we would know that it doesn't. Okay. So the idea, if it tips, okay, what that means is, as you can sort of see, Try to bring up. Uh... All right, so uh, if you know if this thing's going to tip, it's going to rotate about this support right here, the one that's in the middle, kind of in the middle. Uh, and what would happen is, as this person walks to the right, if you could sort of see the normal forces, because these there's two normal forces here, right? The normal forces are supporting the weight of both individuals and the uh, and the uh, and the plank, and uh, they're going to share the weight of these three things, but not equally. Um, depending on exactly where the masses are distributed, it's going to determine exactly how much goes where. But as Bo walks to the right, we will find that there's going to be more weight supported by the. Um, by the normal force that's on the right and less on the left. And in fact, if things tip, then the plank will come off the support on the left and therefore the normal force would go to zero. So that's the condition that I'm gonna set up for this problem is I'm gonna say, well, when it does tip, okay, bow will be standing in the location that would make it tip and the normal force from the support on the left will go to zero. So that's why I'm saying N1 is zero here. So I'm gonna to need to invoke um, uh, a couple of equations here because, um, well, you know, I, maybe I don't, but I don't know, that's what I did here. Uh, anyway, so uh, for the forces in the y direction, n2 will point upward, okay? And that's basically supporting the weight of all three objects. So the rest of the terms here just correspond to the gravitational forces of both per people and, uh, and the plank. And so the sum of all those masses is 240 times 9.8, and that gives us what N2 is, okay? Now I decided to choose from my torque equation the pivot to be on the far left-hand side, um, but you know, I realized that I could have chose it to be at N2, kind of like I did in the other example, but I didn't, well, whatever. That's okay. Nice to mix it up occasionally, I suppose. Um, so we're going to write out the torques for these things. Now, if I choose my pivot at the left-hand side, it means I don't need to consider the force that's being exerted by Adrian. She's standing on the pivot. And uh, again, the pivot is, is a mathematical construct here. It's not a physical thing until things actually move. So, um, you know, Adrian standing uh, directly on the pivot means R is zero, no torque from Adrian. Okay. So let's move to the right. Of course, we have no N1. We have the mass of the plank. And so that plank is 100 kilograms located at a distance of 4.5 meters from the plank. 
So that's this term right here. Okay. And it would produce a clockwise torque, so it's negative. Uh, N2 is 5 meters from the pivot. It would induce a counterclockwise torque, so it's positive. And then we have Bo. We don't know how far Bo is from the left-hand side. Um, and um, but Bo's weight is 90 times 9.8. And uh, negative because of, again, clockwise torque. So I'm going to just solve for x here. And I hit on my n2. And so we can see the math here. Uh, we solve them and get 8.3 meters. Now, the question specifically asks you, however, um, can Bo walk all the way to the right end without the plank tipping over? And he cannot. Right? Uh, when you're two-thirds of a meter from the right-hand side, somewhere right around over here looks like, uh, then it will tip. Okay, so um, if if you if you know if, if this was an issue where, yeah, you know, for example, if Adrian had a much larger weight or something like that, um, it would result in a much larger value for n two. And then what you'd get here is you would, um, you know, this this twelve hundred term here would be would be bigger, and it might be big enough. Um, that you get a value that's above 9. And, um, and if that's the case, um, then obviously Bo can get to the end. So that's the other way you can do it. All right. Well, that's not really another way, I guess. It's just a, a different outcome. But you got to be mindful of this answer here, right? The entire length is, is 9. So if you get something bigger than 9, well, everything's good. All right. I think I actually do have slides now. Hmm. There we go. All right, so what do we got here? Massless rod. Got a scale. I got a pivot on the left. Got a mass on the right. We all know what the scale reads. All right. So think about this for a moment. The answer is C. Why C? Well, Consider what the forces are in the y direction. We have a thousand newtons on the right here. So there's a gravitational vector that points down. Okay. We got a normal force at the scale that points up. Is there a force over here on the left? Yeah, there's gotta be a force that goes down, right? In order to keep this thing balanced, right? Let's shorten these things up actually. We want this to look accurate. Let's shorten these up. So if things are looking accurate, oh no, oh, there we go. It would sort of look like this. Oh my goodness, stop. All right, so we got 1,000 newtons pointing down here. We actually would have an equivalent 1,000 newtons pointing down here, actually, because this thing is in a static equilibrium. So that means the scale is going to read 2,000 newtons, okay, due to this weight and the torque, balanced torque on the left here. So, I mean, obviously, this is not how you should use a of scale, because it's reading a value that's too high, but of course we're not even balancing the weight on the scale. But um, the way I drew the vectors here is, is how things should look. Um, you know, this is some kind of contact force on the left here. And then uh, the force on the right is the, uh, the weight. Normal force is the middle. So it has to be 2,000 for everything to be balanced. All right, moving on. All right, ooh, so this, this is a... We get, now we're getting into so complicated things here. Okay, now we got to be a lot more mindful because now we're getting two-dimensional problems here and we need to start really paying attention to uh, how we are specifying all these equations. Now remember, when the problems get harder, the actual work that you do, the procedures that you do, um, are really not going to be too different. Um, you need to balance equations in x, y, and, and, and for torque. So, you know, look at this problem for a minute here, and, and it actually is a, would it be a good exercise is just, you know, think about how you would even go about doing something like this. So, you've got a ladder leaning up against the wall, and the idea is that at the, at the bottom, right, you know, a ladder could slip um, if, if, uh, if there's enough force that the ladder exerts on the ground. Well, if there's not enough force, I'm sorry, no, if there is enough force, that's what I mean, sorry. Um, then you could overcome static friction and it could slip, 
So we need to consider all the forces that act here, and we need to make sure that we're under max static friction. All right. So again, you may want to stop and think about how you would set this up. And you know, a good exercise really is you know pause this video and just try to solve it, or not, and just watch what I'm going to do. All right. It's a good idea. It may take a long time, you know, but you got all the time in the world. Hashtag quarantine life, right? Okay. So, <clears throat> now, the figure already has all the forces in there. So I'm going to go ahead and just sum all the forces up in the X, Y, and then I'm going to do torques. Okay, so what forces do we have? Well, the ladder has weight pulling down. There are two contacts with the walls. So we have two normal forces. Okay, one that points to the right, one that points up. And we're considering the... Um, uh, static frictional force that would be exerted on the ground. Now, um, one thing you might say here is like, well, what about some frictional forces that might occur at the upper location up here? Yeah, you could consider that, but I think you could argue, and you can work out the values for N1 and N2 here, that uh, N, N, N1, the one on the ground, is going to be much bigger. Much, much bigger. And if this thing's going to slip, it's it's going to be due to the one on the bottom here. I mean, I could consider the one in the, in the upper left. But again, if you work out the numbers here, I think you would see that n one's just much bigger. I mean, look, if you can see that right here in the x equation I already have done here. Um, it's, you know, mu sub s is a, is a fraction, right? It's, it's less than one. So already you can see here n2 is smaller. So anyway, if things are going to slip here, assuming that the surface, then maybe surfaces may not be the same. The ground may have a different coefficient of friction in the wall, but, but I'm only going to consider the ground for this. It's a good problem to consider the, the one up here. It wouldn't be too complicated, actually. But anyway, all right, so what's going on in the x directions? Uh, we have n2 pointing to the right, and we have our static frictional force pointing to the left, and we're going to, we're going to assume, because we want to, Determine the condition of slipping that are at max static friction. So if we're at max static friction, that means that takes on the form of mu sub s times n1. Okay, and one's the contact force at that surface. So I got my x equation here. My y equation's real simple. Weight of the ladder goes down, and no force uh, n1 from the ground goes up. All right, torques. All right, so now let's consider what's going on with the torques. Um, you know, with the pivot being down here again, you don't have to worry about these two forces at all. You got to worry about just the gravitational force in N2. And N2 is going to want to make things go in a uh, clockwise direction. So it's a negative torque. You see a little negative sign there. And gravity is going to want to make things go counterclockwise. And so, you know, what you want to do is you want to have R, F, and uh, sine of the angle. The angle is the uh, angle between the radial line and the force. And so the angle that we're considering is the one that is right here. So it's the one that's right below and to right about there. I'll draw a little green line there. Oh, let me clear that out actually, um, like a circle. So the angle is right here, that's 60 degrees. So we have three and two sine 60. Now if you wanna consider the moment arm, the moment arm is the perpendicular distance from the force down to where the uh, down to where the um, pivot is, and that would be this distance right here. That would be the moment arm. So you can work out what that is, but it's equivalent of, of, of uh, three times sine 60. So that's what that is. So um, <clears throat> now for the gravitational force, uh, the distance is right in the middle, so it's 1.5. Uh, Fg is obviously the weight of the ladder. Um, uh, that will drop out of the equation. We're not told the mass of the ladder, but you'll see that it drops out eventually. And sine 30, because the angle that is located right here, the angle between the radial line and the uh, force vector is 30 degrees. So uh, we would be working out that. Now you can see down here, little D1, that's the moment arm for that one. Again, it's the perpendicular distance from where the force is applied um, to where the pivot point is. So I got my system of equations here, and we can solve. So I'm going to solve for n2 in the torque equation. I have this in terms of fg. Um, you can see that mu sub s is a ratio of n2 to n1, and uh, n1 is fg, right? So I put that together, and the fgs drop out, and I end up with 0.29.
All right, so um, in order for things to uh, not slip here, we got to be above that. It's got to at least be 0.3. Now, 0.3 is it's pretty low. Most things have a much larger static uh, coefficient of friction. So this person, so the slider's safe the way it is. The next exercise would probably be, okay, well, let's have a person start climbing this ladder here. And you can analyze at uh, different locations along the ladder, is there any point where you might overcome static friction for a given value? That's a, that's a good additional problem to do. It's a really good problem, actually. All right, so uh, one more little mini concept here. Uh, and then we have a couple more examples to do. Um, so when it comes to um, balance in objects, um, balance in an object is sort of an exercise in trying to make sure that your gravitational torque isn't trying to do anything. So you see these, you know, it's like a, it's like a thing in the 70s. They had all these, it's like car chases were like huge in the 70s and like early 80s. That was just like a big thing in movies. You ever seen Blues Brothers? There's like this huge car chase in there. And a lot of times they do is they'll have little stunts and stuff. And so one of the things you see is they make a car come up on, a, on its one of its wheels and then it just, you know, drives around like that, and, and uh, you know, how do you do something like that? Well, you know, uh, the car is the center of mass, and uh, if you lift it up on one end, well, the gravitational torque is going to try to bring it back down. Uh, however, you can, you know, make the car come up at uh, such an angle that um, the gravitational torque really can't act because the center of mass will be directly above the pivot. And if that's the case, then the value for R in the torque equation is zero. And that means gravitational torque is not able to, uh, to provide any rotation. So there is a condition for this. And the condition for this is what we call the critical angle here. And if you look at the little triangle that's drawn here, the condition is that um, your angle has to sort of follow the dimensions of your object. So H represents the height of the center of mass above the ground. And T represents the sort of the width of the car. Now T over 2 represents where that center of mass. Kitty. Bad kitty. That was my bad kitty. All right. Um, it would represent where the uh, location of the center of mass is in the X direction. And, um, you know, if if... if you're going to balance this thing, you have to have a critical angle that matches those dimensions. So um, we, take, we take a tangent of this that's opposite over the adjacent. So the opposite is uh, T over 2, the adjacent is H, so we end up with an arctan of T over H, uh, over 2H. And um, basically, if you are at the critical angle, you have things balanced. If you are over, it, it's going to tip over, and if you're under it, that means it, you won't be. Able, it will just basically come back down to its normal horizontal orientation. So let's look at an example of how to do that. All right, cheese. Um, what we're doing in this problem is we're trying to determine uh, how much you can raise this cheese board before the cheese is going to flip over. All right, now. Uh, the pivot will be that that bottom left corner of the uh, of the cheese triangle, right? Um, if you lift this up high enough, it's going to topple over, and it will rotate about that little corner. That's right. Let me highlight that corner in here, right? I mean, you can you can take out your big triangular block of cheese from your fridge that you got right now. Take out your cheese board. Choose your favorite cheese board. And uh, and try this out, and yeah, this, this that little area right there is uh, is going to be where that thing's going to drop. Now, so what do we need to do here? Well, we need to know where our center of mass is. That's part of that equation there. And and what you might remember is we did work this out. We worked this out back when we did our center of mass stuff right at the beginning of chapter. Well, I did it in chapter ten. I think the book did it at the end of chapter nine for some weird reason, but I I, I group it into chapter ten. But we know that the center of mass is a third up from the base of this thing. So if the height is 12 centimeters, that means the center of mass is going to sit at 4 centimeters up. Okay? And, uh, and then since the base is uh, 8, 
that means our width is 8, right? And so we got to work out what the values of t and h are, right? So we got h, right? It's 4 centimeters. Uh, t over 2 is also 4 centimeters. And so uh, we'll need to figure out, uh, you know, when this tips. Well, apparently this tips at 45 degrees, okay? Now, um, to figure out whether um, that's going to cause this thing to actually slip, because there's actually two things you need to be concerned of here, right? You need to be concerned of, is this going to topple over? Uh, or is it going to slide, right? Slide down. So sliding down, and again, this is also previous knowledge. If you remember, we way, 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 way back in, in the forces, we had this problem where I took like an incline. And I think it was like wood on wood or I don't know, something like that. And what I did is we raised the incline and we see at what point does this thing start to overcome static friction and slide. And what we found out there, and you may want to go way back to when we did that frictional stuff that might have been chapter, oh, probably chapter five, I'm guessing, or four. It was the second force chapter, whatever that was. Uh, we found out that the inverse tangent of the coefficient of static friction is how we determine that. And so you put that number in, it's 0 0.9. We get 42 for the slipping angle, and we get 45 for the uh, for the rotational. No, <laughs> 45 for the, uh, for the angle, the critical angle, right? So as we raise this thing, uh, the question becomes, you know, what's going to happen first here? And it looks like it's going to slip down before it topples over. So if you continue to raise it, it will probably start to slip and then it will topple or something like that. But, um, but that's a good stability issue problem. That also, I mean, this was honestly a much more complicated problem, uh, but we have previously done a lot of that work. And that work was the stuff that is done right here. Okay, okay we got one more problem before we're going to be done here. This is a much more complicated problem, but it's a neat little thing. Let's get right into that. Okay, so the way this problem works, and I guess I better bring up my slides here so you really see what I'm what we're looking at. This is a fun problem. All right, so we want to prove uh, by stacking four identical blocks of length L that the last block can actually be placed completely over the ledge. You might have seen this. There's various ways that this shows up, um, but the idea of stacking things and having them extend out over the side. Um, you can actually create some really strange scenarios here. And so we have to sort of prove this. Um, obviously, when we say prove, we're going to run into the assumption that you can do this. So let's go ahead and do it. So I got a pretty elaborate uh, picture here. You may want to spend some time bringing up my lecture examples and just kind of soaking this thing in. It's quite a bit going on here. All right. So... Yeah, that's a little nicer. That's much nicer. Okay. How do we do this? You start from the top. You start from the top. Now here's the thing. What are we where are we gonna put that top block? That top block, we have to we have to make sure that it doesn't topple over. And so that means what you have to do is the center of mass of this top block has to be either to the left, okay of the edge of the bottom block or directly over it. And in fact, we want it to be directly over it because that means we can push as much of the block over the ledge as possible, or at least over the second block. So we're going to move that center of mass so it's directly above the edge of the block, block below it. And that means that the amount of distance that sticks out is L over 2. Then we go to the block underneath it. Now you're considering how to balance the upper two on the corner that's in the middle here. Well, you'd have to consider the center of mass of those two blocks together now. And the center of mass of those two blocks is going to be exactly one-fourth um, the distance from the center of mass of the second one here. Okay, so this, this little dot down here is the center of mass of the two top blocks, right? So look, just to be clear about that, I'm going to draw these two little circles and, and indicate to you how that's going to look. Okay, so here's the center of mass of the top block. Here's the center of mass of the block below it. 
So if I drop, uh, say, a line down here, straight down, we can see that this dot is exactly between the two, and they have the same mass, so that means this is the center of mass of that two-block system, and so that has to be put over the edge, or that has to be put right on, on the edge there. And so then we have, now we have an extra uh, L over 4 that sticks out. Well, we do the same thing, okay? We have, oops, we have the mass of the third block now, right here. That's the center of mass. And then we have the center of mass of the two blocks above it, and but that sits basically right over here. And then again, in terms of, you know, horizontal distance, that's where it is. But, you know, we're basically now comparing one block with two blocks. So the there's going to be like a third uh, here. You're going to be skewed more to the right. So this distance over here is a third. That's like two thirds. So um, I put it on terms of L over uh, six because I'm considering this length over here. And we can see that we have to, so we have a little bit less distance there, and that's L over 6. And you can continue to do this, and you'll see that as you continue to do this, the way you have to balance the masses, like down here, you're balancing one block with three blocks. If I had another one, you'd be balancing one block with four blocks and so on. But what you'll notice is you create a, a sequence, L over 2, L over 4, L over 6, L over 8. And that's a series. And if I add up just the first four terms of the series, I get a value that is larger than one. And that means the sum of these four is bigger than L. That means this block up here, and I try to draw things out as best I could, but I'll try to do that here. If you notice, we're not over the table. We're actually out over the table. And that's pretty astonishing. What's further astonishing is that this sequence here, okay, the sum of the inverse of prime, <laughs> sum of the inverse of the even numbers, okay, is, um, is a divergent series. That means if I have an infinite number of terms, the value of the sum is infinite. And what does that mean? It means I could stack blocks to extend out as far as I would like. I could stack these blocks so that the top block is a mile away from the edge of the table and that would be in equilibrium. That may seem astonishing, but that's the math and that's how that works out. So you actually can do this, okay? Not only can you, four blocks is the minimum to get the top block to stick over, but if you stack more blocks, you could basically make that top block not only stick out over the table, but you can make it stick out as far as you like. You can make it stick out a light here if you like. I mean, you'd have to work out, you know, there's a, you have to work out partial sums here. There's a sequence of partial sums, then you can figure out what value of n would give you a, you know, 10 trillion kilometers or, you know, that's close to what a light year is. Okay, so that wraps up this section on torque and equilibrium and rotational stuff. Thanks for watching.